You can transform your coding approach overnight by understanding the MVC and MVP programming patterns. And more importantly, understanding separation of concerns. Separation of concerns is a fundamental software design principle, which many other principles depend on. Spaghetti code in your Unity project might work for the weekend jam, but it's a nightmare in bigger projects, especially when you're working with a team. Understanding these patterns is easier than you think. Today, we're going to walk through both of the paradigms, and then we're going to implement a practical implementation of an MMO style hotbar with these principles in mind. In game dev or in any engineering, there's no silver bullet pattern that solves every single challenge. MVC and MVP are not just frameworks. I like to think of them as starting points because really what you're after is the separation of concerns. And if a following a framework kind of helps you achieve that, then great. If you were to go and do a Google search right now on Unity MVP or MVC, you're going to get 10 different answers. People are going to name things differently. They're connecting things up differently. They have different levels of coupling in them. It can be confusing for sure, especially if you're a beginner. And so what we're going to do right now first is let's just talk about what the traditional MVP and MVC actually look like. Let's start with MVC. The model holds the essential data and state of your game at runtime. It's the backbone of the logic. So its primary concern is just to represent your data accurately and meaningfully, and not so much about storage and retrieval. Data that you're storing and persisting for your game is not always the same as your model. It doesn't have to be. Now, often your model is going to know how to serialize itself so that the important stuff can be persisted, but it's not exactly the same thing as what you're actually going to store in the cloud or in player prefs or anything like that. Now, the view is the interface. So the view takes care of how this data is presented to the user, your player. So it's the face of your game, right? It's responsible for the layout and formatting of the data that it gets from the controller or directly from the model in some cases. In Unity, the existing UI framework usually is part of your view. So in many cases, it's going to be a mono behavior so that it can integrate with Unity. But the view, really, it could be just as simple as a class that just logs things out to your console. So the twist on MVC is the MVP, where people sometimes call the controller a presenter. The only real difference that you often see here is that the data will be read directly by the view. That means the view has access to the model and, and usually it's a direct connection. But don't get too hung up on the words presenter, controller. Those mean the same thing. It's just the brains of the operation. Don't get too hung up on how you're connecting things together. That's just implementation details. The important thing about both of these frameworks is separation of concerns. This principle is just about dividing a program into distinct sections, each with a specific responsibility. So each one is managing its own concerns all by itself. This separation enhances the maintainability, scalability, even the readability of your code. It makes it easier to debug and way easier to test. Each of these little parts can be developed entirely in isolation. Now, separation of concerns is one of the hallmarks of quality code, along with modularity, high cohesion, and appropriate levels of abstraction and coupling. Now, people often conflate separation of concerns with over-engineering, but there's a big difference between writing quality code and adding unnecessary features. Over-engineering happens when we lose sight of our actual needs and start building for hypothetical situations that may never occur. Quality code is about creating a system that's maintainable, scalable, and understandable. So that's probably enough talk. How about we build something practical that has a model, view, and a controller slash presenter. We'll be coming back to this diagram as we move forward on this ability system. The model represents the abilities on the hotbar. The view is the buttons the player can see and interact with. And the controller is going to handle all the interactions of these things and the execution of the abilities using a queue and a timer. Let's start with the representation of our static data. We can store all this data into scriptable objects. I know each of these abilities is going to be associated with an animation, but I don't really want to pass around the animation names as strings, so I'm going to store a hash as well. Each ability will require a certain amount of time to execute, and I want an icon to show on my hotbar. I'll create an onValidate method that will just calculate the hash for us every time the animation name is updated. I'm going to upgrade this a little bit with some Odin tags and allow for dragging an animation clip right into the scriptable object. Let's see what it looks like in Unity. So now for each scriptable object, I can choose a different animation and it will automatically calculate the hash for me. 
I've set it to be read only in the inspector with an attribute. We'll pass that around when we're firing events off a little bit later. So I've created five abilities so far. Let's move on. The model itself isn't necessarily the same thing as your static data about an ability. The model represents what we're going to work with while the game is playing, and so it can involve behavior and state. My ability model actually needs to know about individual abilities. So each ability can keep track of its own static data, and we can set that with a constructor. Then we can come back up to our ability model here. Here we can have a new observable list of abilities. Let's have a quick look at this. This is very similar to the observable class we used in the last episode, except it works for lists. So when any value in the list changes, we are going to publish an event, and that way our controller will know there's something to do. So essentially this observable list class is just a decorator of an iList object. So anytime the list gets modified at all, we're going to publish an event. Let's come back to the model. At the moment, we only need one public method, and that is so that we can add abilities into our model. And that's it. Let's have a look at our diagram again, just to see where we're at. So we've defined all our static data in a scriptable object, and then our model contains an observable list of as many abilities as we want. Let's move on to our buttons that are going to go on the hotbar. Each button is going to have an ability icon, and then on top of that will be a radial image that shows the progress of that ability. Each button needs to know which position it is on the hotbar. We're also going to associate each button with a key press. So whenever a key is pressed on the button or the button is clicked with the mouse, we'll fire an event. In the start method, we can connect the button up to this event every time it gets clicked. We can also listen for the key press during update. To make it a little simpler to subscribe to the event, let's add a register listener method here. We can call this from the controller. Next, let's add a method so that we can change the icon whenever the ability is changed. And then let's add another method that we can use to update the fill on our radial progress. Finally, let's come back up to the top. We'll add an initialize method here so that we can set the index and the key. We can call this when we're first setting up our hotbar. Now that we have a script for each individual button, let's define our view. The view represents the hotbar, so it needs to have an array of all of our buttons. Let's also define an array that will be our starting values for each key for each hotbar button. Now in awake, we can iterate over all of the buttons we have defined. I've only set five in my hotbar right now. This will initialize each one, giving it an index number and a key assignment. Next, let's create a public method so that our controller can constantly be feeding in the float progress. Now, if for some reason the timer or progress wasn't set or running, let's just default it to zero. And then for each button in our array, let's update the radial fill with that progress value. Finally, if our array of buttons needed to change at all, let's have another method here. So our view will control which ability sprites are going on to which hotbar row, and we're just going to iterate over this list of abilities that gets passed in. As long as there's an ability to go into a button, we're going to set that icon to be the sprite that represents that ability. Otherwise, we can just deactivate the button. Let's come out and look at the diagram again. At this point, we've filled out the left side of the diagram. Each button has two images and knows about its index as well as key that it belongs to. And the view has an array of all of these buttons. Each button on the hotbar is going to publish an event with its index number anytime the button is pressed or the key is pressed. I've jumped ahead in time a little bit just so you guys can see the button itself and the radio going around and what the view actually consists of. So all it is really is the button. The button has the sprite for the actual ability. The radial, the radial is just a transparent, semi-transparent image that gets moved around. It's set to be a filled radial 360. I'm filling it from the top and then I'll move the slider here and you can see what happens. It just fills up the image just like so. So as the progress counts down, it goes down to nothing. And then on top of that, I have another image here. It's set to ignore raycast. That's just the frame that goes on top. Now each button is the same. Now let's finish connecting this thing. Now our controller is going to need to queue up commands to execute. Anytime the radial progress bar is down to 25% or less, the player will be able to enqueue another ability, just like your traditional MMOs. Right now, the commands are only going to play animations, so they're going to fire a player animation event onto the event bus. I'm using the exact same event bus that we built a few months ago, 
In order to execute, every ability command is going to, at the very least, need to know this animation hash, as well as how long it actually takes to execute the command. So for now, I'm going to let it know about the ability data, and we could refine that down a little bit more in the future. When we execute this command, it's going to let the event bus know that we're going to raise this event with this hash. Since our ability class already knows everything it needs to make a command, we can make a public method there that will return us a new command with everything we need to execute. Okay, last piece of the puzzle. The brains of this operation is the ability controller. So the controller is going to have to know about the model and the view. Our controller also needs a queue of commands that it's going to execute and it's going to need a timer. So every time a command has been executed, we're going to start the timer over with the duration of that command. It can have a starting value of zero until there are any commands to execute. Let's make a private constructor for this that's going to accept the view and the model. This is because I want to enforce some constraints with a builder. The builder is going to make sure that we always have a view associated with this. And it will provide an empty model, which we can overwrite with our own abilities. So it's okay to have an empty model. There might be no abilities to start with for some reason, but we absolutely need a connection to both. So in the builder, we'll create an empty model. If we want to add some abilities, we'll have an with abilities method that we can pass in a bunch of these ability data scriptable objects. And that will just add abilities to our model. Then in the build method, we have a precondition here, can't be null for the view. And then we just create our new ability controller with a view and a model. I'll just collapse this up and then we can wire up the view and the model and then work on our logic for issuing commands. So let's encapsulate that logic for wiring things up into two methods. I'll have one for the view, one for the model. Now recall that in our model, we have an observable list. So all we need to do is hook up into that method. Anytime the list of abilities changed, we know it's time to change our, our hotbar. Now, at the moment, I'm not going to do any additional processing in my controller of these abilities. All we have to do is let our view know what the current state of the hotbar is so that it can update each sprite on every button. Now we can connect up our view. We can just iterate over each of the buttons and we need to register a listener for each button press. When we're finished with that, let's call the views update button sprites method for the first time so that all of our hotbar icons are correct right from the start. Now we need to do something when we receive that message that a button has been pressed. So let's make another method here. What we're going to do is say as long as the timer is within that last 25% or it's not running at all, meaning we're not doing anything. As long as our model actually has an ability there, let's enqueue the command for that ability. We'll just create the command right there and enqueue it. And then I'm also going to deselect that button so that it highlights properly in the UI. Finally, we need a method that we're going to call every frame. And I'm just going to call it update, even though this isn't a mono behavior. We're going to instantiate this within a mono behavior. So we'll pass in time.delta time. We're going to update our radial on the view. That'll change it on every button on the hotbar. And then as long as we're able to execute a command and there is something in the queue, let's get it out of the queue, execute the command, reset the timer to the duration of that command and start the timer over again. Guess what? We're almost code complete. Let's have one more look at our diagram. All right, so at this point, we've got our model, our view, and now we've introduced our controller. So the controller had a queue and a timer. We've wired up the model to the controller. We've wired up the view to the controller. And the controller, every time it executes a command, the command itself is pushing a new event out onto the general event bus. So my animation system or any other system that's listening receives the event and reacts. Only one thing left to do, and that's to create a mono behavior that's going to house all of this operation. I'm going to call that ability system. This class doesn't need to do too much because we've encapsulated all the logic already. It's going to need a reference to the view. It's going to need all of our starting abilities, those scriptable objects that we want to begin with. And then it needs to instantiate the controller, passing in the view and the abilities. And then every update, it just needs to tell the controller, here's our time.delta time. That's all we need to do. Now we need to put this onto a game object, preferably our hero, I think. Let's go try it out. All right, so after linking everything up together, it certainly is working. Now you can practice the ABCs of MMO casting.
As soon as the progress is almost up, you can enqueue another ability and it'll fire off as soon as the uh, progress is totally done. So I hope today imparted a bit of new knowledge, but also can act as a foundation for some of you to develop your own unique style in Unity game development. Remember, the ultimate goal is to create code that is as efficient and manageable as it is creative and functional. If you're one of those people who wants to dig a bit deeper, I recommend Sam Ravello's courses on Udemy. He has one about MVC frameworks and one about testing. Both are about five hours long and full of good info. If a five hour course isn't your thing, there's lots more videos on this channel. Check out one of these boxes on your screen.